station down. <clears throat> Those who have been granted leave to uh, appear in this round of hearings have been notified of that fact and they in turn have uh, told the Commission uh, of who's representing them and I will take therefore appearances uh, as read and there will be no need for Council to announce uh, their appearances. The number of people uh, who applied for leave to appear uh, were refused that leave and I want to uh, say something shortly uh, about that because uh, some of those who sought leave uh, thereafter wrote to the solicitors for the Commission seeking further consideration of their application uh, and uh, in effect uh, expressing uh, surprise or complaint uh, that they had not been granted leave. I've looked again uh, at what they said uh, in support of their applications and I want to uh, just say a little more about them, that is the applications. At the initial public hearing of the Commission, uh, I said that I fully recognised that those affected by what they considered to be misconduct want their complaints recognised and considered. And they want those responsible held to account. But I also said at the opening uh, sitting that the Commission will not have time to publicly examine every case of alleged misconduct. Instead, as I said, we will have to proceed by reference to case studies and examples with a view to identifying the kinds of misconduct that have occurred why it occurred, what should have been and what was the response to discovering the misconduct, and then what follows uh, from those conclusions and observations. In this set of hearings we will look at several case studies. Persons who've been refused leave to appear all have complaints that are different from the issues we will be looking at in these case studies. None of the complaints they make is the subject of any of the case studies. None of those refused leave will give evidence during these hearings. None of the complaints they make will be decided during these hearings or in consequence of them. And that's why I said in refusing them leave to appear that they do not have any direct or substantial interest in the evidence that will be called during these hearings. That's why I said that they show no interest in the evidence to be given at these hearings that is greater than or different from any other member of the public or any other person who alleges that he or she has been affected by conduct amounting to misconduct or conduct falling short of community standards and expectations. I emphasise again, as I did at the opening sittings, that those refused leave to appear and any other person who wants to say that a financial institution engaged in conduct of a kind with which the Royal Commission is to be concerned should make their submissions to the Commission through the Commission's website. The submissions made by the public are very important to the work of the Commission. All of the submissions 
that are made through the website are being read and assessed and considered. All of the submissions that are being made through the website will form an important part of the material on which the Commission will base its work. Ms Orr. <coughs> Commissioner, this is the first round of public hearings for this Royal Commission into misconduct in the banking, superannuation and financial services industry. This round of hearings will inquire into aspects of consumer lending. From early on in the Commission's inquiries, <coughs> it was apparent that there were issues in relation to the conduct of financial services entities in consumer lending, which required very careful consideration and scrutiny. Almost all Australians are consumers of credit products. This round of hearings will focus on four different types of credit products, home loans, car loans, credit cards and overdraft facilities. A further area of focus will be insurance sold in connection with a credit product. These hearings will explore some of the issues that arise for Australians in their dealings with financial services entities in respect of these credit products. We will be unable to explore all the types of issues that arise in this context. However, as we noted at the first public hearing, a great deal of the Commission's work is being conducted outside of the public hearings through the task of extracting and reviewing documents and through consultation with stakeholders. Much work in relation to consumer lending has already been done. More will continue to be done beyond these hearings. In this opening address, we will traverse a number of topics which we hope will assist the Commission the public and those who have been granted leave to appear to better understand the case studies that will be explored over the coming two weeks and the purposes for that exploration. The structure of this opening address will be as follows. First, we will begin by explaining why each of the consumer lending products to be explored are of significance to consumers and to financial services entities. Second, we will explain some of the key features of the legal framework in which consumer lending occurs, which is a complex and ever-evolving one. Within that framework, we will look at the particular roles that credit providers and intermediaries play in the provision of consumer credit. Third, we will summarise what consumers have told the Commission about their consumer lending experiences. Many stories have come to us through public submissions submitted via the Commission's online portal, but stories have also come to us from consumer bodies and advocates. After this opening address, you will hear directly from Ms Karen Cox of the Financial Rights Legal Centre, a body working at the grassroots level with consumers who have experienced difficulties with consumer lending. Fourth, we will touch on what the two external dispute resolution bodies who deal with consumer lending disputes, the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit Industry Ombudsman, have told the Commission. These external dispute resolution bodies are being replaced later this year with a unified body, but they have provided information to the Commission about a body of complaints from consumers going back almost 10 years. Fifth, we will summarise the work that regulators, such as the Australian Securities Investments Commission, or ASIC, and the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, or APRA, have done in relation to consumer lending. We will also identify some of the work that those entities are doing that remains ongoing, to which the Commission will pay close regard throughout the course of the year. We will also highlight some of the ongoing consideration of consumer lending issues by other inquiries. Sixth, we will summarise what financial services entities and intermediaries have acknowledged to the Commission as their own misconduct and conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations in relation to consumer lending. Early in its work, you, Commissioner, 
sought information from financial services entities for the Commission about misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and we will refer to some of the information provided in response to that request. Finally, we will briefly address the nature of the evidence that will be heard over the next two weeks, giving an overview of the case studies that the Commission will be considering and why these case studies have been chosen. We will highlight the key themes and questions that we see running through these case studies, upon which we will invite written submissions at the end of these hearings. To begin, I turn to the consumer lending products through which the conduct of financial services entities will be addressed in this round of hearings. The first week of hearings will focus predominantly on the conduct of financial services entities in connection with applications for home loans. Many Australians have home loans with one of the major, bank, major lenders. Housing loans are the largest asset held by ADIs or authorised deposit taking institutions. In 2017, authorised deposit taking institutions provided about $1.6 trillion in housing finance. Uh, much of this was for owner occupied housing. In the September quarter of 2017, housing finance made up around 42% of ADI assets. As at November 2017, the average balance of residential term loans to households was $264,000. The average balance was higher for interest only loans, $347,000, and loans with offset facilities. $314,000. Residential home loans represent a substantial part of lending for many of the entities that are to be the subject of case studies in these hearings. For example, residential mortgage lending constituted approximately 60% of NAB's total lending for the period from October 2016 to September 2017. For CBA, as at 31 December 2017, its total lending was $586 billion, of which $374 billion, or 64%, was attributable to lending by its retail banking services unit. The proportion of ANZ's total lending as at September 2017 in relation to residential mortgages was approximately 45%, of the ANZ Group's total lending based on the Group cash profits basis and approximately 64% of the total lending for Australia based on gross loans and advances and Group cash profit basis. As noted in ASIC's report number 516, Review of broker, Mortgage Broker Remuneration, as at 2015, the majority of borrowers who secured a home loan engage the services of a mortgage broker to apply for a home loan. In the four quarters to March 2017, the value of the loans placed by brokers was equivalent to around 11% of nominal GDP. According to the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia, in the September quarter of 2017, mortgage brokers settled $51.77 billion, or 55.7%, of all residential home loans. In 2017, NAB approved over 89,000 home loans submitted by brokers, result resulting in a total lending of $30.23 billion. For CBA, as at the end of 2017, 41% of its home loan portfolio was comprised of loans that were offered through mortgage brokers. For ANZ, 58% of home loans were approved via brokers during the year prior to 30 September 2017. In recent years, banks have acknowledged that aspects of their conduct in connection with home loans have been unacceptable and have caused detriment to consumers. As a result, a number of banks have provided refunds to customers as part of significant remediation programs 
which are generally overseen by ASIC, the key regulator in the consumer credit industry. Information provided to the Commission by ASIC indicates that since 1 July 2010, almost $250 million in remediation has been paid to almost 540,000 consumers by financial services entities as a result of three particular forms of conduct in connection with home loans. The three forms of conduct were reliance on fraudulent documentation, processing or administration errors, and breaches of responsible <coughs> lending obligations. Since 1 July 2010, ASIC has banned and suspended from providing credit services or placed conditions on the licences of 51 individuals or companies for engaging in home loan application fraud. Through the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, ASIC has brought criminal prosecutions against 13 credit providers for conduct in relation to home loan applications, 12 of whom have been convicted of fraud or dishonesty offences. ASIC has also banned one person from providing credit services and cancelled the credit licence of two entities on the basis of breaches of responsible lending laws in connection with home loan applications. The second credit product that we will deal with in this round of hearings is car loans, being personal loans obtained with the specific purpose of buying a new or used motor vehicle. In the month of December 2017, finance commitments for motor vehicles in Australia, including commercial and lease finance, totaled around $2.8 billion. In 2017, finance commitments for motor vehicles totaled around $35.7 billion. As at March 2017, ASIC estimated that 90% of all car sales were arranged through finance. Of these sales, around 39% were financed through a dealership and 61% were financed from other sources. Stratton Finance, an Australian finance broker specialising in car financing, has produced research that indicates that in 2017, the average car loan size across Australia was $39,445. The median car loan size across Australia was $31,003. And the most popular car loan size across Australia was $20,000. Since the 1st of July 2010, almost $90 million in remediation has been paid to almost 17,000 consumers by financial services entities as a result of two forms of conduct in connection with car loans, being reliance on fraudulent documentation and breaches of responsible lending obligations. Since the 1st of July 2010, ASIC has banned or cancelled or suspended or placed conditions on the licences of 19 individuals or companies in the car financing industry through the Commonwealth Director of Public <coughs> Prosecutions, four car loan credit service providers have been convicted of criminal offences. As a result of action taken by ASIC in the car financing industry, over $5.7 million has also been paid in civil penalties. The third credit product that we will deal with in this round of hearings is credit cards. As at November 2017, there were around 16.7 million credit and charge card accounts in Australia. These accounts had total balances of around $52.2 billion. The average balance per account was around $3,128. As at the September quarter of 2017, credit card debt made up around 1% or $51.4 billion of the assets held by ADIs. As at the 31st of December 2017, 
CBA's net credit card balances for CBA branded personal credit cards and business credit cards with individual li liability was approximately $10.75 billion. This equated to approximately 1.8% of CBA's total CBA branded lending as at that date. As at January 2018, Westpac's total balances for all credit card products, comprising products that remain for sale and those which were no longer sold, was $9.41 billion. As at 28 February 2018, the credit cards presently on issue by Citigroup had balances totalling approximately $5 billion. Since 1 July 2010, over $11 million in remediation has been paid to over 34,000 consumers by financial services entities in response to breaches of responsible lending obligations in connection with credit cards. Since that time, ASIC has also obtained four outcomes against three credit providers for breaches of responsible lending obligations in connection with credit cards, and as a result, $1.5 million has also been paid in civil penalties. The fourth credit product that we will deal with in this round of hearings is add-on insurance. Consumer credit insurance is a common form of add-on insurance which is sold with a number of credit products including credit cards, personal loans, home loans and car loans. It is designed to protect consumers if something happens to them that affects their ability to meet their credit repayments. In 2011, ASIC published a report which analysed data from 2009 provided by 15 ADIs that sold consumer credit insurance. The report found that in 2009, 661,902 consumer credit insurance policies were sold and 19.4% of consumers who purchased home loans, personal loans or credit cards from ADIs also purchased consumer credit insurance. Since 1 July 2010, over $128 million has been paid in remediation to consumers by financial services entities as a result of particular conduct in connection with add-on insurance. Approximately $900,000 of this sum related to home loan add-on insurance remediation programs affecting over 10,500 consumers. Approximately $117 million related to car loan add-on insurance remediation programs affecting over 212,000 consumers. Approximately 10 million related to credit card add-on insurance <coughs> affecting approximately 65,000 consumers. <coughs> the fifth product that we will deal with in this round of hearings is personal overdrafts. Overdrafts are credit facilities connected to a bank, building society or credit account which allow a customer, customer to overdraw up to an agreed amount of money that is more than the customer has in their account. Much like credit cards, overdrafts attract interest and very often fees and charges in certain events. As will be explored through these hearings, the issues surrounding overdrafts have a number of similarities to the issues surrounding credit cards. The final topic that we will deal with in this round of hearings is not a credit product, but a set of problems that has occurred in connection with credit products such as home loans. Those problems concern account administration and processing errors by financial services entities when providing consumer credit products. This issue is of substantial financial and practical significance to both consumers and financial services entities. This can be demonstrated by the fact that as a result of work done by ASIC since 1 July 2010, approximately $239 million has been repaid 
to almost 540,000 consumers who have been affected by account administration and processing errors in connection with home loans, such as failures to link offset accounts and failures to apply the correct interest rate. This remediation has been paid by financial services entities such as ANZ, CBA, Bank West, NAB, Westpac and the Bank of Queensland. We turn to the legal and regulatory framework for consumer lending. This is important because the Commission's terms of reference require it to give consideration to the adequacy of existing laws and policies and forms of industry self-regulation which are intended to identify, regulate and address misconduct in consumer lending and to meet com community standards. The Commission's terms of reference also require it to give consideration to whether any further changes to the legal framework are necessary to minimise the likelihood of misconduct by financial services entities in the future. As an initial matter, we observe that the legal framework governing consumer lending in Australia is multi-layered and complex. It has recently been augmented and further reform is in the pipeline. Prior to 1998, lending to consumers, sometimes referred to as consumer credit, was regulated under the Trade Practices Act, which governed most aspects of consumer protection law. In 1998, financial services products, including consumer credit, were removed from the purview of that Act and mirror provisions were inserted into what became the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act, which I will refer to as the ASIC Act. The catalyst for this was the landmark Wallace Report of 1997, which recommended, among other things, the introduction of specialist regulatory arrangements for consumer protection. Since that time, financial products and services have continued to be treated differently from other goods and services. The regulator for financial and credit services is ASIC, whereas the key regulator for consumer goods and services is the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. In 2008, amidst the fallout of the global financial crisis, the Council of Australian Governments agreed that a new national regime was required to ensure that consumers were better protected in their dealings with credit products and credit providers and to ensure consistency between state and territory regimes. In 2009, the National Consumer Credit Protection Act came into effect. I will refer to this as the National Credit Act. It is now the central consumer protection legislation applying to consumer credit. It includes the National Credit Code which is Schedule 1 to the Act. Relevantly, some of the key aims of the National Credit Act are to regulate credit industry participants in addition to credit contracts and transactions, including by way of a comprehensive licensing regime, to establish industry-wide responsible lending conduct requirements for licensees, and to enhance consumer protection through dispute resolution mechanisms court arrangements and remedies. The regime created by the National Credit Act is an important anchor for many of the case studies that will be considered over the next two weeks. For now, we highlight four key aspects to the legislative regime created by that Act. The first is that the regime requires many entities that engage in consumer credit transactions, including banks and mortgage brokers, to hold an Australian credit licence for their particular credit activities or to be appointed as a credit representative by another licensee. Those who are required to hold a licence fall into two categories, credit providers such as banks and credit assistance providers, such as brokers. Not all entities who engage in consumer credit transactions are required to be licensed under the National Credit Act 
or to comply with the responsible lending obligations to which I will come. In particular, the national credit regulations provide an exemption for persons assisting consumers to apply for credit at the point of sale, including at car dealerships and retail stores. When the National Credit Act and National Credit Regulations were enacted, Members of Parliament foreshadowed that this exemption may be reviewed. However, the point of sale exemption remains approximately eight years later. The second key aspect of the regime created by the National Credit Act is that it imposes certain prohibitions on the holders of Australian credit licences, which are designed to ensure that lending provided by or assisted by these entities is responsible. The prohibitions are similar for both credit providers and credit assistance providers. Credit providers such as banks are prohibited from entering into a credit contract with a consumer unless they have assessed whether the credit contract will be unsuitable for the consumer. Credit assistance providers such as mortgage brokers are prohibited from suggesting that a consumer apply for a particular credit contract with a particular credit provider unless they have assessed whether that credit contract will be unsuitable for the consumer. The National Credit Act provides limited guidance on when a credit contract, such as a home loan, will be unsuitable for a consumer. It tells us that a credit contract will be unsuitable if it is likely that the consumer will either be unlikely to comply with the financial obligations under the contract or could only do so with substantial hardship or if the contract will not meet the consumer's requirements or objectives. The National Credit Act also tells us that substantial hardship is to be presumed where the consumer could only comply with their financial obligations under the contract by selling their home. For credit cards, issues have arisen with assessing whether a credit card is unsuitable for a customer because only minimum payments are required to be made to the entity issuing the credit card, not the full credit limit. This has set a somewhat low threshold for the consumer's ability to meet their financial obligations under the credit contract. However, very recent amendments to the National Credit Act will change this so that if a consumer would be unable to repay an amount equal to their full credit limit within a specified period, they will be taken to be able to comply with the contract obligations only with substantial hardship. These changes will come into effect on 1 January 2019. The National Credit Act contains further relevant prohibitions. A credit provider or a credit assistance provider must not enter into a credit contract or suggest that a consumer do so unless they have undertaken certain inquiries and verified certain matters before making their assessment of unsuitability. They are each required to make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation and their requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract and to take reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation. Various practices have been adopted in an attempt to ensure compliance with the National Credit Act. In particular, banks and brokers have lending policies and tools to help assess whether a loan or credit card is not unsuitable. Some of these processes are automated and some also entail the use of proxies or benchmarks to assess a consumer's financial situation. The third key aspect of the regime created by the National Credit Act is that it sets out what are called general conduct obligations for licensees. These obligations will also be referred to in these hearings. 
The obligations are set out in section 47 of the Act and include an important obligation, an obligation to do all things necessary to ensure that the credit activities authorised by the licence are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Another important obligation is the obligation to ensure that there are adequate arrangements in place to ensure that the clients of the licensee are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise wholly or partly in relation to the credit activities engaged in by the licensee or its representatives. The final key aspect of the regime created by the National Credit Act to which we will refer today is the enactment of the National Credit Code which forms part of the Act. One of the things that the National Credit Code does is to prescribe a process whereby a customer can give a hardship notice to the credit provider and request a change to their credit contract. As the Commission has been told in submissions from the public and will hear in the coming weeks, credit contracts have been a cause of hardship for many consumers, whether by themselves or in confluence with other factors in the life of the consumer. The manner in which credit providers deal with situations of hardship is important and must meet the expectations and standards of the community. In addition to the National Credit Act, the ASIC Act also applies to suppliers of credit products and services, including suppliers of business credit and investment credit. The ASIC Act contains largely equivalent provisions to those found in Australian consumer legislation that was previously known as the Trade Practices Act. These include prohibitions against misleading or deceptive conduct, unconscionable conduct and unfair contract terms. Some of the legislation to which we have just referred will be the subject of reform over the coming year and this is a matter that the Commission will have regard to a ban on unsolicited offers of credit limit increases will take effect from 1 July this year and credit providers will also be required to give consumers online options to cancel credit cards or to reduce credit card limits from 1 January next year. Comprehensive credit reporting for the major banks will also be required from 1 July this year and is aimed at improving lending practices customer outcomes and competition. This will involve further amendments to the National Credit Act. In addition to the laws made by Parliament, lending transactions are also governed by the common law handed down by the courts. Some of this judge-made law involves the application of the legislation we have just described to a particular set of facts. Other cases involve other bodies of legal principle such as contract law and tort law, which operate more generally in respect of consumers' dealings with financial services entities. All of the law to which we have just referred is complemented by a suite of secondary material, including guides produced by ASIC, industry codes of conduct and the practices adopted by external dispute resolution bodies. The key guides published by ASIC to which reference will be made in these hearings, are Regulatory Guide 209 and Regulatory Guide 205. The first, which was published in 2014, provides guidance on entities' responsible lending obligations under the National Credit Act. The second, which was published in June 2010, elaborates on the general <coughs> conduct obligations of licensees under the National Credit Act. Both documents provide guidance on a regime which is at once both complicated and non-prescriptive. The guides do not have the force of law, but adherence to them is generally accepted within the industry as good practice. A further relevant regulatory guide is Regulatory Guide 78, which was published in 2014 and relates to the obligation of Australian financial services licensees to report breaches of certain statutory obligations to ASIC. The Code of Banking Practice 
is another relevant document. Like the ASIC regulatory guides, it does not have the force of law, but contains guidance around industry standards. It is a voluntary code published by the Australian Banking Association that has been adopted by most banks offering retail products in Australia, including credit products. The banking code therefore applies to most banks when they provide home loans, car loans and credit cards, as well as other credit products. Among, among other things, the banking code includes obligations about disclosure, financial difficulty and responsible lending. A key provision is clause 27, by which a bank promises to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and in forming an opinion about the customer's ability to repay the credit facility before giving or increasing such a facility. Non-compliance with the Banking Code can be examined by the Banking Code Compliance Monitoring Committee. Banks who have adopted the Banking Code are required to report to this committee about their compliance on an annual basis. The current version of the Banking Code was published in 2013. It was independently reviewed in 2016 and 2017. The Australian Banking Association has announced that a revised code has been provide to ASIC, provided to ASIC for approval. However, this revised code has not yet been approved or made public. During the first public hearing one month ago, we noted that the Commission had begun the process of commissioning a series of reports from experts to assist it with its work. One such report has been prepared by Dr Jeannie Patterson of the Melbourne Law School and Ms Nicola Howell of the Queensland University of Technology. The report is entitled Everyday Consumer Credit, an overview of the Australian law regulating consumer home loans, credit card and car loans. It provides a great deal of detail on the legislative and regulatory regimes which we have summarised today and it will be made available on the Commission's website in coming days. The Commission welcomes comments on that paper, which may be provided to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Commission. Before leaving the legal and regulatory framework to turn to the matters that members of the public have raised with the Commission, we make some observations about the role of intermediaries in the provision of consumer credit. Intermediaries play an important role in the distribution of two of the consumer credit products upon which we will focus, being home loans and car loans. These intermediaries often provide the link between the consumer and the financial services entity providing the credit product. We make some observations about the role of intermediaries in relation to each of these two credit products. First, as noted in the Commission's second background paper, which has been published on the Commission's website, mortgage brokers act as an intermediary in the home loan market by matching borrowers to lenders and their loan products. Mortgage brokers assist and advise borrowers on the home loan application process and in relation to negotiating interest rates on home loans. As mortgage brokers engage in credit activities, they are regulated by ASIC under the National Credit Act. As we have already noted, they must hold an Australian credit licence or be an authorised representative of a mortgage aggregator or any other entity that holds such a licence. Mortgage brokers are now the central channel for residential mortgage financing. As we mentioned earlier, mortgage brokers settled $51.77 billion or 55.7% of all residential home loans in the September quarter of 2017. The other key intermediary in the home loan market is the mortgage aggregator. As also set out in the Commission's second background paper, Mortgage aggregators act as a further intermediary between mortgage brokers and lenders by providing mortgage brokers with access 
to the lenders on the aggregators panel. Mortgage aggregators have contractual arrangements with lenders, which in general terms allow brokers operating under the aggregator to arrange loans from those lenders, although brokers may still need to be separately accredited with those lenders. The aggregator system can provide mortgage brokers with access to a wider range of lenders than may otherwise be possible, as mortgage aggregators can achieve greater economy of scale by aggregating greater volumes of mortgages across different brokers. Aggregators can also provide mortgage brokers with support services such as technology infrastructure, marketing and professional training. As mortgage aggregators also engage in credit activities by acting as an intermediary, they must also hold an Australian credit licence. If a mortgage broker operates under the licence of a mortgage aggregator, then the mortgage aggregator is responsible for the conduct of that broker. We turn to intermediaries in the car finance market. There are two key intermediaries in this market and both undertake the function of matching borrowers and lenders for car loan products. The first key intermediary is the finance broker. A finance broker provides broking services for personal loans, including those for car purchases. As finance brokers engage in credit activities, they are also regulated by ASIC under the National Credit Act. Unless an exemption applies, a finance broker must also hold an Australian credit licence or be an authorised credit representative of an entity that holds such a licence. The second key intermediary is the car dealer, which is the business that sells the new or used car to the consumer. Car dealers may have a direct contractual and commercial relationship with car financing companies to allow consumers who purchase a vehicle from their dealership to access car financing from a financing entity. In this situation, the car dealer effectively acts as a distributor of the financing entity's car loan products and may be potentially eligible to be exempted from the consumer credit licensing requirement. Car dealers may also serve as a distribution channel for a range of add-on insurance products, which provides another avenue by which car dealers can greatly influence consumer outcomes. As we have already noted, car dealer intermediaries are exempt from the licensing and responsible lending provisions of the National Credit Act. We turn to the information we have received from members of the public in relation to consumer lending. As at 5pm on the 9th of March 2018, the Commission had received 1,894 submissions from Australians through the Commission website, a figure that is up significantly from the approximately 385 submissions that had been received at the time of the first public hearing in February. Approximately 43% of the public submissions received to date relate to personal financial dealings, totalling 806 out of the 1,894 submissions received. Of these submissions, 228 or 28% have come from New South Wales, 204 or 25% have come from Victoria and 175 or 22% have come from Queensland. Of the 806 submissions relating to personal financial dealings, 88% described conduct that was considered to be misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. 29% of the submissions related to the culture or governance practices of organisations and 38% related to the effectiveness of redress for consumers. Within those 806 submissions, the most frequently raised issues concerned consumer lending matters, such as home loans and mortgage broking, credit cards, consumer banking, personal loans and car loans. 
we make some observations about the public submissions in relation to home loans and credit cards in particular. In relation to home loans, some Australians have expressed concerns about both financial services entities and brokers falsifying documents to obscure the true circumstances of consumers in order to obtain larger loans for the consumer. Their submissions relay concerns that the consumer is then left in a precarious position of paying off a loan that should not have been approved for that consumer in the first place. Some Australians have expressed concerns that financial services entities and brokers intentionally neglect to ask for all relevant documents relating to a consumer's income so that they avoid proper verification processes. Some Australians have expressed concerns about financial services entities unilaterally changing the terms of home loan contracts without consulting the consumer. Concerns have been expressed that at times the consumer may be expected to make increased repayments at short notice as a result of these changes. In relation to credit cards, a number of themes have emerged. One commonly identified issue is the dangers of granting credit card pre-approvals to consumers without verifying their financial situation. Some Australians express concerns that consumers who are already struggling to make credit card repayments are offered credit card limit increases without the means of making repayments. Australians have also raised issues about credit card providers failing to act in the best interests of the consumer. One specific example identified is the situation in which those entities offer consumers a credit card where a personal loan would have been more appropriate to their circumstances. Australians have also referred to concerns about the fees associated with credit cards, including international transaction fees. Many of the themes identified by consumers in their submissions to the Commission website are consistent with those raised by peak consumer bodies in their submissions to the Commission. The Consumer Action Law Centre, based in Melbourne, identified a number of trends through its work directly with consumers. In relation to home lending, Consumer Action observed a lack of appropriate inquiries being made by financial services entities as to the suitability of loans. <coughs> they observed the use of benchmarking when undertaking affordability assessments, such as the Henderson Poverty Index or the Household Expenditure Measure. They also observed systemic issues with brokers failing to recommend the most appropriate loans. In relation to credit cards, Consumer Action observed financial services entities failing to properly assess the ability of an individual to make credit card repayments. They observed offers of increases or balance transfers without assessing individuals' financial situations, hiding of the true cost of credit cards through teasers such as low annual fees, interest-free periods, balance transfers and reward schemes, and providing unsolicited offers of credit via loopholes. Consumer Action noted that in December last year, 31% of callers to its financial counselling service had issues with credit card debt. In relation to car finance, Consumer Action told us that car problems accounted for 20.7% of all calls made to its legal practice, and nearly 30% of these related to car loans and repossessions. Consumer Action identified what it considered to be systemic, irresponsible lending in the car finance industry, particularly to low-income and disadvantaged consumers. Consumer Action also observed financial services entities having little or no contact with customers as a result of broker intermediaries. Consumer Action also told us about the prevalence of low value, unsuitable add-on insurance sold in car dealerships. The themes identified by the Financial Rights Legal Centre based in Sydney were similar. 
we will shortly hear evidence from the coordinator of the Financial Rights Legal Centre, Ms Karen Cox, in relation to the issues that consumers report to it in relation to consumer lending. The submission to the Commission from Choice largely focused upon misconduct and conduct falling short of community standards and expectations in relation to home lending. Choice's sub submission identified a number of key themes. In relation to brokers, Choice raised concerns about the lack of disclosure of broker commissions, the incentive structure of broker commissions, and brokers potentially providing unlicensed financial advice. More generally, Choice referred to concerns about interest-only loans and add-on insurance products, particularly in the home loan setting, the lender's mortgage insurance product. In relation to credit cards, Choice identified issues associated with unsolicited offers of credit and issues associated with what it termed unfair or improperly disclosed credit card fees, including fees on overseas transactions. Choice also raised concerns about consumers being denied low-cost personal loans and instead being offered higher-cost credit cards. In relation to car finance, Choice expressed concerns about breaches of responsible lending obligations, particularly to young people on low incomes. Choice also referred to concerns about an over-reliance on benchmarking to assess capacity to repay and concerns about excessive fees. In the case studies that will be presented over the next two weeks, a number of these themes will be observed. We turn to the submissions provided to the Commission by the two principal external dispute resolution bodies currently operating in the consumer lending area. These are the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit Industry Ombudsman. We start with the Financial Ombudsman Service, or FOS, as it is known, whose members include each of the ADIs, which are the subject of the case studies to be explored in these hearings. FOS told the Commission that in 2016 to 2017, it received 18,525 disputes in relation to credit. It noted that most of these disputes related to consumer credit products such as home loans, credit cards and personal loans. FOS also reported that it had seen increases in disputes about responsible lending over the years and that responsible lending continued to be one of the key issues in disputes about financial service providers' decisions. The Credit Industry Ombudsman, whose <coughs> members include non-bank lenders and mortgage brokers, also made submissions to the Commission concerning misconduct in consumer lending. The Credit Industry Ombudsman noted that since January 2008, it had made 12 systemic issues findings and 15 serious misconduct findings in relation to mortgage brokers. The most common issues identified by the Credit Industry Ombudsman related to responsible lending, issues relating to fees and collection processes and poor complaint handling processes. We turn to some more detail about the work of Australian regulators, particularly the work of ASIC in connection with consumer lending. As we have already noted, ASIC is the key consumer regulator providing oversight and enforcement in relation to credit providers and credit service providers. An understanding of ASIC's work in this area and where that work has been concentrated provides some insight into the types of misconduct engaged in by those entities in the past and how prevalent those practices may be. Since the global financial crisis, ASIC has undertaken work focused oh. on ensuring better compliance from lenders and brokers with their responsible lending obligations, as well as reducing the extent to which consumers are sold consumer credit products that do not meet their needs. ASIC's recent work in enforcing compliance with the National Credit Act has included obtaining enforceable undertakings from consumer credit providers and finance brokers, exercising its administrative powers to cancel licences 
or ban persons from providing services in the industry and taking court action. ASIC has commenced civil penalty proceedings alleging breaches of responsible lending obligations in relation to home loans and car loans and has worked with the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions to institute criminal prosecutions for fraud committed by mortgage brokers. A recent example of a relevant civil penalty proceeding commenced by ASIC is the proceeding it has commenced in the federal court last year against Westpac concerning Westpac's use of benchmarks in assessing a potential borrower's expenditure as part of a suitability assessment in a home loan application. This proceeding is important to the Commission's work because it will consider whether the use of a benchmark called the household expenditure measure instead of the actual living expenses declared by a potential borrower is permissible under the National Credit Act. Use of this benchmark will be examined in some of the case studies in these hearings and requires careful consideration. Other examples of relevant litigation brought by ASIC are the Cash Store and Chanik cases, which led to two of the only judgments to consider the responsible lending obligations in the National Credit Act, as well as the litigation that ASIC has recently concluded against ANZ in relation to its car finance arm, Asanda. The Asanda proceeding resulted in a penalty of $5 million being paid by ANZ for contraventions of the responsible lending provisions of the National Credit Act in respect of 12 car loans which were approved without reasonable steps being taken to verify the borrower's income. A recent example of a relevant criminal proceeding is the criminal prosecutions commenced in response to the large-scale fraud in respect of home loans arranged by Myra Home Loans. ASIC has also been involved in monitoring and surveillance activities. One example of this work is the home loan shadow shopping exercise that ASIC is conducting this year, which seeks a better understanding of the process experienced by a consumer when using a broker or through a lender. ASIC has also made recommendations to financial services entities in respect of the verification of borrowers' financial information and the assessment of borrowers' suitability for home loans. Recommendations such as these often follow reviews by ASIC into what is happening in the market. ASIC has undertaken a number of recent reviews of interest to the Commission into mortgage broker remuneration, consumer experiences with credit insurance policies, and the practices of the largest credit providers and brokers in respect of interest-only home loans. ASIC is continuing to conduct reviews into home lending practices. The second stage of ASIC's review into interest-only home lending will also be published later this year. ASIC's findings in these reviews may be published before the completion of the Commission's inquiries and will be of relevance to the work of the Commission. Less common than these streams of work are ASIC's acts of regulatory intervention in the consumer lending market. A recent example of this is the legislative instrument issued by ASIC to formally ban flex commissions in the car finance market after it found that flex commissions were leading consumers to pay excessive interest rates on car loans. ASIC also exercises its administrative powers to impose conditions on ADIs who are licensees. As a result of recent legislative amendments, <coughs> ASIC will soon also be able to take direct action to intervene in the sale of products, including credit products, where it identifies a risk of significant consumer detriment. ASIC works cooperatively with APRA in relation to consumer lending regulation. As the prudential regulator of the Australian financial services industry, APRA's work on consumer lending is conducted through its focus on the prudential safety and soundness of ADIs and the stability of the Australian financial system. Although the Commission's terms of reference do not require the Commission to consider macroprudential policy and regulation, 
APRA's research and learnings in this area provide insight into the lending practices of ADIs and whether these might depart from expected standards. APRA has been particularly concerned to ensure sound residential mortgage lending practices and has been monitoring trends in this area for some time. In 2014, APRA wrote to all ADIs outlining a range of measures to reinforce sound residential mortgage lending practices. This was followed up with a letter in March 2017 which identified specific risks. APRA has recently made recommendations that ADIs adopt measures such as limiting investor lending growth and limiting new interest only lending. APRA is also conducting a targeted review in respect of residential mortgage lending and serviceability assessments by ADIs, which is of interest to the Commission. In August 2017, APRA announced a prudential inquiry to examine the frameworks and practices in relation to the governance, culture and accountability within the CBA group. APRA released the inquiry's progress report on 1 February this year, which indicated that the panel's substantive findings and recommendations for inclusion in the final report will be provided to APRA by 30 April this year. The findings in the final report will also be of interest to the Commission. The ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, is another regulator that has also undertaken work in respect of credit providers and intermediaries. As the regulator of competition across all industries, the ACCC has commenced proceedings against financial services entities for misleading or deceptive conduct, including in respect of the marketing of home loans and credit cards. The ACCC will soon also report on the pricing of residential mortgage products by the five banks affected by the major bank levy. We turn to the information provided to us by financial services entities about whether their own conduct has constituted misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. On the day after the letters patent issued, you, Commissioner, wrote to a number of entities in the financial services industry and related representative bodies and asked them to address a number of questions. You invited each of these entities to identify any misconduct they had engaged in or any conduct falling below community standards and expectations since 1 January 2008. You drew attention to the definition of misconduct in the Commission's terms of reference, which includes conduct that constitutes an offence against a Commonwealth state or territory law, as in force at the time of the alleged misconduct, conduct that is misleading or deceptive or both, conduct that is a breach of trust, a breach of duty or unconscionable conduct, or conduct that breaches a professional standard or a recognised and widely adopted benchmark for conduct. After receiving responses to these letters in January, you Commissioner wrote to a number of the entities again and asked them to provide more specific information about instances of misconduct in the last five years. The approaches taken by the entities to responding to your questions differed. Some entities made significant efforts to provide considered and thorough responses to your questions. Other entities took a less comprehensive approach. It is worthwhile to impart some of the detail of the responses from the six entities which are the subject of case studies in the first round of hearings. In doing so, we will refer to many events of actual misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations that have been acknowledged by these six entities. It should be noted that many of these acknowledged events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations affected very large numbers of consumers, in some cases thousands or hundreds of thousands of consumers, and the event 
may have extended over the course of a number of years. We will deal with the responses from the six entities in alphabetical order. We start with ANZ. ANZ provided two submissions to the Commission in which it acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct falling short of community standards expectations relating to home loans, credit cards, processing errors and car finance. ANZ acknowledged that in the last five years there were at least 20 events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to home lending and residential mortgages. It acknowledged at least nine events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to credit cards, including the lack of disclosure of overseas transaction fees in the terms and conditions of consumer credit card products. It acknowledged at least seven events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to car loans and car finance, including failures to take reasonable steps to verify income stated in car finance applications. It acknowledged at least 22 events of more generalised misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in connection with consumer lending including customers being charged incorrect fees or interest amounts, customers accessing inflated redraw balances and redrawing amounts in excess of the amount of principal they paid in advance, and failures to send hardship notices to applicable customers within the 21-day period required by the National Credit Code. We provide some further details of a few of the examples of conduct acknowledged by ANZ. First, in the 2015 to 2016 industry-wide review into interest-only home loans, ASIC, after calling for a sample of 25 customer files from ANZ, queried whether ANZ had made genuine inquiries into customers' living expenses. ANZ recognised that there were instances where it lacked evidence to show that genuine inquiries had been made but it did not accept that it had not made those inquiries. Second, between 2003 and July 2013, some ANZ home loan customers were charged a higher interest rate than they should have been according to the terms and conditions of their loan contracts. In addition, some offset accounts were not properly linked to home loans, resulting in customers being charged excess interest. This affected approximately 400,000 customer accounts and ANZ ultimately refunded customers approximately $69.3 million. ANZ has also identified other home loan processing or administration errors. These issues will be examined further in one of the case studies in these hearings. Third, ANZ acknowledged that between 2009 and February 2016, there were inconsistencies between interest rates contained in customers' original letters of offer for certain commercial credit cards and those charged by ANZ systems to some customers. This affected 52,135 customer accounts and customers were ultimately refunded approximately $10.4 million last year. Fourth, ANZ identified a number of issues relating to the Asanda dealer finance portfolio, which was owned by ANZ until April 2016. Between 2011 and 2014, a car finance broker had arranged loans for customers which did not meet Asanda's lending criteria by writing the application in the name of an individual who did not own or have possession of the vehicle but who agreed to guarantee the loan. ANZ accepted that the systems that Asanda had in place at the time were ineffective to detect this and therefore failed to meet community standards and expectations. ANZ has also accepted, in the recent litigation brought by ASIC to which we have referred, that it failed to take reasonable steps to verify the income figures in relation to 12 car finance applications introduced to Asanda by third party intermediaries. We will return to this later in this opening address. Fifth, 
between November 2014 and January 2015, ANZ issued a series of mail-outs to a group of existing customers, offering them an overdraft facility with limits of $500 or $1,000 in circumstances where ANZ had failed to make inquiries about the maximum credit limit required by the customer. In February 2016, ASIC issued five infringement notices totaling $212,500 for these alleged failures. Again, we will return to this later in this opening address. Finally, ANZ acknowledged that in the last seven years, approximately 120 cases had been brought against it in FOS that related to consumer and small business responsible lending issues. Approximately 50 of these cases were decided against ANZ. We turn to Aussie Home Loans. Aussie Home Loans is a wholly owned subsidiary of CBA. However, Commissioner, you chose to write to Aussie Home Loans separately from CBA and to provide Aussie Home Loans with a 50-page limit to explain any misconduct or conduct that fell below community standards and expectations that it had engaged in over the last 10 years. Aussie Home Loans chose not to provide its own separate response to your letter. Instead, Aussie Home Loans chose to include its response within the response of CBA. The portion of CBA's submission that contained the response from Aussie Home Loans was brief. It consisted of eight paragraphs each of which was in the part of CBA's submission that was directed not to misconduct, but to conduct that had fallen below community standards and expectations. Aussie Home Loans acknowledged no misconduct in the last 10 years. Could the Commission be shown document ID RCD.001.0003 dot zero 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 four. Commissioner, this is CBA's response dated 29 January 2018 uh, to your first letter. Could we turn to point zero zero three four in that document? Commissioner, you will see there the paragraphs of the CBA submission that related to Aussie Home Loans, commencing at 3.6. Is it possible to expand that part of the document? Thank you. As can be seen, CBA told you, Commissioner, in paragraph 172, that Aussie Home Loans had not identified any systemic misconduct or any systemic practice, behaviour or business activity falling below community and standards and expectations engaged in by Aussie or on its behalf during the relevant period. But it provides the following information about issues it has identified. The relevant period, I pause to say, is the 10-year period. Uh, CBI advised that Aussie Home Loans had identified a number of so-called issues, which included at 173, isolated and unauthorised incidents of conduct issues and some technical breaches of the law in relation to the credit assistance services provided by Aussie brokers and in interactions between employees and Aussie brokers. CBA also said that there had been isolated issues which required customer remediation in relation to Aussie's white label products. White label products will be discussed in the course of these hearings. A white label loan is a loan offered by a particular lender, such as CBA, which is sold to the consumer under a different brand, such as the Aussie Home Loans brand. Uh, if we could turn to the next page in that document. at paragraph 174. Commissioner, you will see that at 174, CBA provided examples 
of the nature of isolated and unauthorised conduct issues that Aussie had identified, including former brokers using customer information and seeking to contact Aussie customers in contravention of their contractual and privacy obligations, provision or facilitation by brokers of false or misleading information and false declarations from customers in the process of applying for loans, behavioural conduct, such as offensive or otherwise unprofessional behaviour directed towards or amongst employees and or brokers. And Aussie had also identified some minor system or process errors resulting in incorrect calculation of interest, fees or charges by the credit providers on, o providers on Aussie white label products and a small number of self-identified contraventions of the National Credit Act. In response to a second letter from you, custom, uh, Commissioner, and we can take that document down now, thank you. CBA provided a spreadsheet outlining instances of misconduct identified by Aussie Home Loans over the last five years. This spreadsheet referred to at least seven events in relation to breaches of responsible lending obligations, two further events in relation to brokers failing to provide credit products in line with a customer's requirements or requests, and eight further events in relation to other types of misconduct in respect of home loan applications, including falsification of documents. We turn to Citibank. Citibank acknowledged that the complaints it received from customers predominantly related to product features, including rewards points, the timeliness of its processing of applications for products and approved credit limits. Citibank acknowledged six events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to credit cards and loan accounts. Citibank did not distinguish between these, these two categories in its submission. The conduct acknowledged by Citibank was, in summary, as follows. First, Citibank did not consistently apply all the requirements of ASIC's e-payment code relating to certain transactions on customers' accounts that were disputed by customers, which led to improper treatment of some of those transactions. Second, in 2016, ASIC identified that Citibank needed to improve its disclosures to customers so as to convey more clearly why purchases from particular retailers, which may not have an obvious foreign connection, were subject to international transaction fees. We will return to this event later in this opening address. Third, in 2017, Citibank recognised that it had not been actively refunding credit balances on closed credit card and loan accounts to all customers, contrary to the account terms and conditions. Fourth, Citibank acknowledged that customer contact for the purpose of debt collections was a category in which misconduct or conduct falling short of community expectations may have arisen over the years. Fifth, Citibank acknowledged that in the course of assisting customers experiencing financial hardship when the subject of debt collections, their conduct may have involved misconduct or conduct falling short of community expectations, including because of excessive time taken to assess customer applications for hardship review. Sixth, Citibank acknowledged that in 2015, it had listed a number of customers who had entered into hardship arrangements or had complaints in progress as being in default, incorrectly and inappropriately. We turn to CBA. CBA provided two submissions to the Commission. CBA's first submission adopted a high level and general approach, which meant that it did not disclose the totality of the conduct that it has engaged in in relation to consumer lending over the last 10 years that constitutes misconduct or conduct that falls below community standards or expectations, as a number of other entities have done. In its first submission, CBA acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct in limited respects. First, CBA acknowledged that it had been involved in legal proceedings in which an adverse comment or finding had been made against one or more of the entities of the group. Second, 
CBA acknowledged that ASIC had issued infringement notices and penalties to CBA entities. These included four infringement notices totalling $180,000 in 2016 in relation to breaches of responsible lending laws when providing personal overdraft facilities. Further detail on this event was provided in CBA's second submission, dated 13 February 2018. We will return to this event later in this opening address. Third, CBA acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct in late 2011 or early 2012 in its approach to seeking consent from credit card customers to receive credit limit increases, which resulted in CBA giving an enforceable undertaking to ASIC. Fourth, CBA acknowledged that it had remediated customers in respect of product administration and disclosure, credit decisions and responsible lending, systems controls and processes failures, sales practices and fraud or misconduct. CBA's submission does not allow us to determine whether the remediation programs in relation to some of these categories of conduct pertain to consumer credit products. CBA's first submission also acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to add-on insurance, responsible lending and offers of credit. In relation to add-on insurance, CBA acknowledged that approximately 65,000 of its customers had purchased credit card plus insurance in circumstances where they may not have met the employment eligibility criteria in the product terms and therefore may not have been able to claim certain benefits under the policy. CBA acknowledged that refunds of approximately $10 million, including interest, had been made to those customers as at the date of the 29 January 2018 submission. This was described by CBA not as misconduct, but as conduct falling below community standards and expectations. CBA also acknowledged that a further 20,000 consumers had purchased their loan protection product, another insurance product sold in connection with a home or personal loan, in circumstances where they may also not have met the employment eligibility criteria to claim benefits under the policy. CBA indicated that its investigation into this conduct was at an early stage, but that it estimated that approximately $3.4 million of refunds would need to be made to consumers. Again, this conduct was not described by CBA as misconduct, but as conduct falling below community standards and expectations. We will return to CBA's conduct in connection with Credit Card Plus Insurance and Loan Protection Product Insurance later in this opening address. In relation to responsible lending, CBA also described what it referred to as operational incidents that it said had impacted upon its responsible lending practices, including in relation to inaccuracies in calculations, insufficient documentation and verification, failure to correctly follow scripting, employee and third party misconduct, and deficiencies in controls around manual loan approval processing. Again, these events were not categorised by CBA as misconduct, but rather as conduct that had fallen below community standards and expectations. In relation to unsolicited offers of credit, CBA referred to a further event in 2014 relating to a failure to correctly follow scripts when processing credit, credit limit increases. Further detail was provided on this issue in CBA's second submission of 13 February 2018. Much of the information provided by CBA in its second submission was not in a form which made it possible to easily understand the type and the scale of CBA's misconduct events over the past five years. CBA's principal contribution in this regard was to produce a large volume of spreadsheets containing, and I quote, all details of compliance incidents that had been logged since 1 January 2013 
in circumstances where compliance incidents were defined to include an actual, suspected, potential, likely or imminent contravention or breach of a compliance obligation. The volume of material provided made it difficult to assess in any meaningful way the type and scale of CBA's misconduct. We turn to National Australia Bank, or NAB. NAB provided two submissions to the Commission in which it acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to home lending, credit cards, personal loans and processing or administration errors. In relation to home lending, NAB acknowledged the following misconduct. First, misconduct in connection with NAB's Introducer Program, which we will return to later in this opening address. NAB has identified approximately 2,480 customers to date who may have been impacted by this misconduct and investigations were said to be ongoing. Second, NAB acknowledged misconduct in the advertising of variable interest rates in October 2014, when NAB incorrectly advertised that it was offering the lowest standard variable rate for more than five years, a statement which should have been qualified to make clear that it was only correct insofar as it applied to rates offered by the four major banks. Third, NAB acknowledged offset account failures, whereby it overcharged interest on certain home loans in the period between 2010 and 2017 because it had not linked some offset accounts to broker-originated home loans. This resulted in approximately 178,000 customers overpaying interest on their home loans. Fourth, NAB provided examples of conduct that it considered to fall below community standards and expectations in relation to home lending. These included an acknowledgement that prior to June 2013, NAB may not have been carrying out further inquiries into the declared living expenses of home loan applicants when the declared expenses were below the relevant benchmark used by NAB to assess home loan applications. The examples also included an acknowledgement that NAB had identified an issue in relation to Ubank, a division of NAB's, Ubank's offer of a $2014 FPOST gift card to customers who took out a home loan with Ubank in a four-month period between December 2013 and March 2014. ASIC had raised concerns that some details of Eubank's offer were not disclosed in some of the advertisements or were not disclosed in a clear and prominent manner. In relation to credit cards and personal loans, NAB acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct between 2008 and 2013 arising from the erroneous recording of 16,288 credit defaults against customers with NAB credit cards or personal loan accounts. NAB noted that some of this conduct also involved contraventions of the Privacy Act. In relation to credit cards, NAB acknowledged that it had engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. I provide two examples. First, 10 NAB employees had deviated from NAB's policies and processes by failing to contact credit card customers to confirm their needs and objectives or to make it clear that they were not obliged to accept a NAB credit card. The number of customers potentially am impacted was 215 and the number confirmed to have been impacted by NAB was 18. Second, between February and May 2009, NAB migrated customers with NAB Gold Reward accounts to NAB Qantas Gold accounts and sent these customers an American Express credit card without being requested by the customers. The number of customers affected by this conduct was not disclosed by NAB. In addition, NAB acknowledged processing or administration errors in relation to consumer lending during the relevant period. For example, NAB acknowledged that on 24 November 2010 and 15 April 2011, two separate failures of the customer account processing systems occurred, 
with the 2011 incident resulting in approximately 70,000 customers not receiving expected payments into their accounts. NAB also acknowledged that between 2007 and 2010, customers with NAB Visa debit cards were being incorrectly charged reference or overdraw fees, resulting in approximately <coughs> $1.8 million in fees being refunded. NAB's second submission elaborated on a number of aspects of its first submission and provided some further detail. However, the submission did not grapple with the task set by you, Commissioner, to provide comprehensive information about instances of misconduct, including instances of possible misconduct still under investigation, of which the bank had become aware at any time since 1 January 2013. Finally, we turn to Westpac. Westpac made two submissions to the Commission and late last week, Westpac informed the Commission that the information it had provided did not take account of some categories of data and that further acknowledgements may be provided. Last night, Westpac confirmed that it had additional material that it will be producing. Westpac acknowledged that it has a number of brands, including St George Bank, Bank of Melbourne and Rams, that cater to consumers. In the submissions that have currently been provided to the Commission, Westpac has acknowledged that across these brands, it has engaged in actual or potential misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations relating to home lending, credit cards, car loans, add-on insurance, processing or administration errors and unsolicited offers of credit. In relation to home lending, Westpac acknowledged that it is currently the subject of ASIC enforcement action in relation to alleged breaches of responsible lending obligations. ASIC alleges that Westpac failed to properly assess whether borrowers could meet their repayment obligations before entering into home loan contracts. Westpac is defending the proceedings. Westpac also acknowledged that in 2016, it identified that some of its authorised home lending bankers were not correctly completing customer income and expense verification activities at the point of sale. Westpac also acknowledged that over a seven year period, customers with Westpac, St George, Bank of South Australia and Bank of Melbourne did not receive benefits for which they were eligible in relation to a home loan package they held. Approximately 175,000 Westpac customers were affected. The number of affected customers with St George, Bank of South Australia and Bank of Melbourne is still to be determined. In the context of credit cards, Westpac acknowledged that approximately 6,600 accounts may have been affected between 2012 and 2014 by an automated approval process that did not adequately take income and employment factors into account. Westpac also acknowledged that it had applied higher interest rates to credit cards than required by an enforceable undertaking Westpac had given to ASIC. This issue affected 67,000 customers between 2012 and 2015. In relation to car loans, Westpac identified issues relating to the unsuitable sale of insurance and the use of flex commissions, which as Westpac noted, ASIC considered could operate unfairly by providing an incentive for intermediaries to increase the price of a credit contract to a consumer. Westpac acknowledged that processing failures resulted in approximately 69,000 home loan customers being required to pay more interest over the life of their loan because their interest only loan was not switched to principal interest and fees at the conclusion of the agreed interest only term. Remediation to customers is expected to cost Westpac $11 million. Westpac also acknowledged that 133,000 accounts held by customers under the age of 21 did not have the correct fee waivers applied to their accounts and a further 28,000 St George accounts were also affected. A total of $9.2 million has been remediated to customers. More broadly, Westpac acknowledged 
a number of events of misconduct in relation to home lending. In one instance, Westpac approved a loan referral from a third party broker for a home loan of over $529,000 to an 80 year old man who spoke poor English. A credit card debt approved at the same time was later written off. Westpac acknowledged at least 16 events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to processing or administration errors for home loans and credit cards. It acknowledged at least 12 events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to credit cards, including a practice of proactively selling credit cards with limits exceeding the levels advised under lending policy rules to clients over the phone. Westpac acknowledged at least four events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to car loans, primarily comprising breaches of the responsible lending obligations. It acknowledged at least three events of misconduct or conduct falling short of community standards and expectations in relation to add-on insurance products. It acknowledged at least two events of misconduct or conduct falling short of community standards in relation to unsolicited offers of credit, including a message sent by Westpac to at least 3,700 customers that was deemed by ASIC to be misleading, creating the impression that a customer had to consent to receive invitations for credit limit increases in order to receive the full benefits of their credit card. We will return to Westpac's practices in relation to car loans and in relation to credit card limit increases later in this opening address. The types of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations that have been acknowledged by these six entities are not unique to these entities. The Commission received acknowledgements of similar misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations from a number of other banks and broking entities which provided submissions in response to the Commissioner's invitations. The consumer lending conduct that will be examined in these hearings therefore represents only a part of the consumer lending misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations that has been acknowledged to the Commission. We turn finally to the case studies which are to be explored in this first round of hearings. A list of the case studies was published on the Commission's website approximately two weeks ago. The order of the case studies listed on the Commission website was indicative only and further timing will be published on the Commission's website throughout the week. The first case study concerns NAB and its discovery in late 2015 of misconduct by a number of bankers who had arranged home loans through the NAB Introducer Program. Introducers are persons who introduce potential home loan applicants to a bank in exchange for a commission. Unlike brokers, they are not required to be licensed or regulated by the National Credit Act. The Introducer Program was extremely profitable for NAB during the period when the misconduct occurred, bringing in over $24 billion in home loans from 2013 to 2016. The misconduct of the bankers was varied. NAB discovered falsified loan documents, dishonest application of customers' signatures on forms approving introducers' commissions, and provision of unsuitable loans. 60 bankers, including branch managers, were involved. Over 20 were dismissed or left NAB. The breadth of the misconduct, both in number of bankers and loans, and the number of years over which the misconduct occurred, warranted further exploration in these hearings. The second case study concerns CBA's accreditation of and relationships with mortgage brokers. Last year, CBA revoked the accreditation of numerous mortgage brokers who were previously accredited to submit home loan applications to CBA. This case study ties in with the next one, which concerns Aussie home loans. Aussie is a well-known mortgage broking entity with over 1,000 brokers operating throughout Australia. 
Aussie, as we have noted, is a wholly owned subsidiary of CBA and comes within CBA's governance framework. This case study will look at Aussie's structures and processes, in particular in the context of misconduct by four former Aussie mortgage brokers found to have engaged in fraudulent conduct in submitting home loan applications. The number of complaints received by the Commission about mortgage brokers, both from consumers and consumer bodies, as well as the recent work of ASIC in relation to broker remuneration, made this case study appropriate for examination in these hearings. We will also examine a case study that concerns the sale by CBA of two types of consumer credit insurance to which we have already referred. As we have said, the first type of insurance, Credit Card Plus insurance, was sold to approximately 64,000 people who were unable to make claims under all parts of the insurance policies that they had been sold because they did not meet the necessary employment criteria to do so. The second type of insurance, loan protection product, home and personal loan insurance, involved a similar defect. We will hear evidence from a purchaser of one of these add-on insurance products. CBA's practices in respect of these products warranted further examination in these hearings, particularly given the large number of customers affected and the significant period over which the issues with these two products occurred. We will then turn to case studies associated with administrative errors, including in respect of credit products. Two of these relate to account administration errors, one by CBA and one by ANZ. The CBA case study concerns a programming error in the automated serviceability calculator used by CBA to assess applications for personal overdrafts. <coughs> As a result of the error, between 2011 and 2015, CBA failed to take into consideration the declared housing and living expenses of some consumers, instead substituting a zero figure of a low benchmark for those expenses. CBA paid four infringement notices, totaling $180,000 in relation to this conduct, and also informed ASIC that would, it would write off a total of around $2.5 million in overdraft balances. The ANZ case study concerns ANZ's assured overdraft facility and breaches of the National Credit Act in connection with that facility. Between November 2014 and January 2015, ANZ issued a series of mail-outs to a group of existing customers offering those customers a pre-approved overdraft facility with pre-selected limits. ASIC issued five infringement notices to ANZ in respect of this conduct, totalling $212,000. Both these case studies raise important questions about responsible lending. These types of processing errors are further explored through an additional case study examining ANZ's large-scale remediation programs for five distinct processing errors. The errors related to various home loan accounts, including the break-free home loan product, failures to link offset and home loan accounts, errors with interest rate margin accounts, margin discounts not being applied to home loan accounts, and failures to link offset accounts to eligible retail home loans. ANZ has undertaken a number of customer remediation programs in respect of inadvertent system, process and human failures in its Australian division, including those the subject of this case study. These customer remediation programs have totaled more than $74 million. The Commission will also examine two case studies that concern the practices of car finance companies, which are also associated entities of two of the major banks, Westpac and ANZ. Given the point of sale exemption and the complaints of customers in respect of car finance, the need for further explanation of car finance intermediaries and credit providers made these case studies a logical choice. Westpac provides car finance under the brand names of St George and Bank of Melbourne, and those loans are typically received via dealer intermediaries. We will hear evidence of a borrower 
and her experience of obtaining finance through an intermediary. The second case study in relation to car loans concerns Asanda Finance, which was owned by ANZ. As we have noted, ASIC has recently secured penalties in respect of breaches of the National Credit Act for lack of verification of borrowers' pay slips. And this case study will look more broadly at the practices of Asanda in assessing and verifying loans through intermediaries. We will also explore case studies dealing with credit cards and offers for increases to credit card limits. We will hear evidence about Westpac's approval of credit card limit increases in breach of the National Credit Act. Westpac recently completed a remediation program in respect of 3,400 customer accounts, with a total of $11.3 million being refunded to consumers. We will also explore the incentive and remuneration programs of Westpac and CBA in respect of employees at those banks who are involved in the sale and marketing of credit card products. The final case study involves Citibank's failure to properly disclose international transaction fees in respect of Australian dollar transactions on credit cards. Those fees arose where the merchant used an overseas-based bank or entity to process its transactions. In 2017, Citibank refunded approximately $5 million to around 223,000 credit card con consumers. As with many of the case studies that we have spoken of, this case study will be a useful example from which to consider the adequacy of entities' responses to consumer harm and whether internal processes and practices are in keeping with community standards and expectations. The case studies that we will examine in these hearings raise a number of common themes and questions for consideration. These include the following. First, was the misconduct in question attributable to a particular culture, system or practice within the entity, including in particular in relation to remuneration, incentive or commission arrangements. Second, why did the misconduct go undetected and in some instances for a long period of time? Third, were the entity's processes adequate to prevent and detect the misconduct? And fourth, did the entity respond in a timely and sufficient way to the misconduct. Some case studies will present an opportunity to consider each of these questions, while others may present only a few. Over the course of the next two weeks, evidence will also be presented for a num from a number of members of the public who will share their consumer lending experiences. The individuals who will give evidence include a home loan customer who has experienced financial hardship, a purchaser of unsuitable add-on credit card insurance, a car loan customer who experienced hardship after taking on a car loan, and a consumer with various credit cards and debts. Each of these individuals has a complaint about the conduct of a particular financial services entity. Their stories will give practical insight into the significant impact that misconduct and conduct departing from community standards and expectations can have on the lives of consumers. Commissioner, that concludes the opening address. Thank you very much, Ms. Orr. <coughs> I might uh, adjourn until uh, 12 noon to allow Council to uh, reorder their papers. <coughs> 12 noon. <coughs>